Hello and welcome everyone to our latest presentation on pulmonary infections complicating ARDS. VAP complicating ARDS appears to be a very common problem affecting nearly 20 to 40 percent of the patients. This high frequency may be explained by the bronchial contamination due to endotracheal intubation and the mechanical ventilation duration, the impaired local that is the alveolar and systemic defenses and the other is specific and other non-specific factors which make the ARDS patient more prone to developing VAP. Here we can see a survey which was conducted in 2011 and 2015 and if we look at the VAP rates they remain almost similar and there has been no change despite all the measures that have been implemented which shows that maybe all these measures do not really reduce the incidence of VAP, rather VAP is more of a disease which is because of the patient's own ability to fight against the infection. So let's look at the pathophysiology of why ARDS patient develop VAP. First is the immune defenses. Apparently paradoxical immune state of critically ill patients whereby activated immune cells mediated organ damage while manifesting impaired antimicrobial defenses. So it's kind of a paradoxical state where the increased immune response is causing organ damage while when the immune response is against the antimicrobial agents, it is, appears to be impaired. These dysfunctional immune cells are found in lungs as well as in peripheral blood. Now, pulmonary macrophages and dendritic cells demonstrate prolonged suppression of immune functions, which increased the susceptibility to secondary infections or development of the VAP. While exhaustion and apoptosis seem to be very central to the lymphocyte defects, there are other genetic factors like reprogramming of the epigenetic functioning, increased cellular metabolism or so-called trained immunity which is resulting in the impairment of the immune defense. This results in high production of inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and tissue necrotic factor alpha during the secondary immune challenge. Now glucocorticoids which have been classically considered as immunosuppressive drugs have been shown to prevent this immune reprogramming which has been observed after an inflammatory response. This immune reprogramming reduces the ability of the immune cells to fight against the microbes. So the addition of glucocorticoids in ARDS may be helpful in preventing even secondary infections also but this still remains a theory. The next pathophysiological thing is the respiratory microbiota as we have already seen that lung microbes are very highly variable and it has been seen that they play a very important role in the lungs innate immunity and once there is a variation in it it makes the organism more prone to infections this is some preliminary study which was published in mice and this have been subsequently established in humans also. This is a study on dynamics of the pulmonary microbiome during mechanical ventilation in ICU. And they did find a very strong correlation with the occurrence of pneumonia in patients who had a deranged microbiota. Pre-existing dysbiosis such as the induced by tobacco smoke may also influence the development of ARDS following major trauma. Now VAP should therefore be conceptualized as less of a de novo infection by an exogenous pathogen but rather a dysbiotic response to critical illness with overgrowth of specific genre of bacteria. Appropriate antibiotic therapy targeting dominant species those frequently detected by culture is key in certain patients but risks exacerbating dysbiosis and cause further harm to the patients especially if that culture is not really associated with a clinical infection. Now here we can see 
this is the normal flora which gets affected because of the endotracheal tube and presence of suctioning and microaspirate. There is also translocation of the bacteria from the gut, especially in intubated and ventilated patients. The overgrowth of these pathogenic specimens results in a clinical infection. So this lung, altered lung microbiota is also getting affected because of intercurrent antibiotic therapy, altered immune response and the presence of catecholamines. All these things stimulating the overgrowth and making of certain bacteria whereby disrupting the normal flora. This dysbiosis is one of the primary reasons resulting in a secondary pneumonia. The next most important pathophysiological cause is hyperoxia. Hyperoxia is very common in patients receiving mechanical ventilation with ARDS. Now lung safe trial reported 30% of the 2005 analyzed patients had hyperoxia on day one and 12% had sustained hypoxia over the first week. Now oxygen toxicity is mainly related to the formation of reactive oxygen species. However, high level of inspired oxygen is responsible for denitrogenation phenomena also. This results in inhibition of surfactant production resulting in expiratory collapse and atelectasis. Prolonged hyperoxia also impairs the efficacy of alveolar macrophages to migrate phagocytes and kill the bacteria, resulting in decreased bacterial clearance. Now hyperoxia has also been seen to exaggerate bacterial dissemination and lethality in pseudomonas pneumonia. And back Hyperoxia is, has been established as an independent risk factor for ventilator associated pneumonia. Here we can see the prolonged ex sustenance of PaO2 more than 120 is a strong risk factor in developing ventilator associated pneumonia and it is quite significant. Now denitrogenation, decreased surfactant production, reduced bacterial clearance, hyperoxia associated acute lung injury. All these things contribute to the development of VAP because of hyperoxia. The next important thing is the diagnostic challenges that we face uh, in knowing the patient has VAP. Now classically a pneumonia is a histopathological diagnosis where we can see inflammation inside the lungs but clinically it is impossible to do a histopathological examination of the lungs in all cases of pneumonia. So what do we rely on are these things that is the clinical, radiological, laboratory and microbiological surrogates to make a proxy diagnosis of pneumonia. Clinically we rely on the auscultatory findings, sputum, deteriorating uh, ventilatory parameters, radiologically a diffuse or infiltrate or uh, air bronchograms, now, since we already know that pneumonia is one of the commonest causes of ARDS, in that case, to know that there is a new infiltrate is extremely difficult and very, very clinically challenging and has a lot of subjective variations in diagnosis of VAP. Now, coming to the lab assessment, we rely on the total lymphocyte count, neutrophil numbers, the C-reactive protein, procal, and alveolar cytokine levels but none of these have been really validated yet and we really don't know if they indicate pneumonia or infection at some other site. Microbiologically we are relying on cultures, PCR based detection and antigen based detection but again very difficult because we still don't know the appropriate method of collecting the samples and even the proper timing of taking the sample is not yet established. Now these are various biomarkers as we have discussed before also the alveolar and peripheral blood biomarkers but they still have quite uncertain use especially in diagnosis and bedside diagnosis of ARDS. Epidemiology of nosocomial pulmonary infection in ARDS. Which bacteria are causing more infection? So this is a study which was published and showing the various 
bacteria which are producing infection in ICU acquired pneumonias and comparing it with the ARDS is roughly similar. You get mostly the infections with Pseudomonas, Staph aureus and other enterobacteries. Atypical causes of respiratory infection. Apart from these common bacteria which are infecting, we sometimes get some atypical organisms, mainly the aspergillus. The mechanism of damage involves the combined damage to the alveolar cells induced both by ARDS and making them more vulnerable to aspergillosis. Along with this, a dysregulated local immune response together with septicis induced immunosuppression, innate immunity and antigen presentation impairment account for uh, development of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in previously colonized patients. Apart from this, HSV and CMV are frequently recovered from lung and blood of ICU patients, especially ARDS patients. But how does it implicate uh, pneumonia or not, we are still not sure about the interpretation and the impact of HSV and CMV in patients who are on mechanical ventilation. Now specificity of pulmonary infection in ECMO patients. ECMO as we know the venovenous ECMO is, has now become a part of management of refractory ARDS and uh, Bizarro et al reported large prevalence rate of nosocomial infection of 21% patients in a large international registry of ECMO patients. Now, the changes in pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic of antimicrobial agents because of the increased volume of distribution can also result in a delayed appropriate antibiotic treatment and concurrently increase the burden of infection in the ECMO patients. Now coming finally to the antimicrobial therapy that we need to give to patients who have ventilator associated pneumonia. Now hydrophilic antimicrobial agents are found in the extravascular lung water but for relevant lung tissue penetration the lipophilicity is the most important thing. Now large molecules such as vancomycin, ticoplanin, aminoglycoside, cholestins will have a very poor lung tissue penetration when given intravenously. So if you are at all trying to give any of these agents, it is better to go for a nebulization route rather than going for an intravenous route because these drugs will never reach the lungs intravenously. Now beta lactams have a much better lung parenchyma penetration compared to other hydrophobic agents. Now the extravascular lung fluid concentration and the plasma concentration ratio of the TG cycline is around 1 which means that it doesn't really reach very high concentrations inside the lungs and this is also in the extravascular lung water. The lung its penetration into the lung parenchyma is even lesser. So TG cycline is not a very good agent when you are giving for ventilator associated pneumonia but if you don't have any agents obviously this is something which you can try. Now lipophilicity, the lipophilic compounds such as macrolids, ketolids, quinolones, antifungals, antivirals these are very good lung tissue penetration. The ELF and plasma ratio is much more than one which means that they have a very good lung penetration even after the intravenous administration. So these drugs can be given intravenously. Now ventilator setting and procedures usually recommended for improving aerosol delivery that is high tidal volume, low respiratory rate, low inspiratory rate. These are very difficult to implement in ARDS patients especially those who have a very severe form of ARDS. So even the nebulization is a very difficult procedure in uh, to improve the lung penetration of the antibiotics in these cases. And there have been some new methods of trying to nebulize and increase the availability of drug to the lungs. This is the microdialysis. These are the new equipments which are being used to increase the delivery of the um, antibiotic into the lung parenchyma. Now coming to the drug dosing 
many of the drugs can be given in the inhaled route like ampicillin sulbactam septazidim imipenem levofloxacin vancomycin dobramycin amikacin cholestin as far as cholestin is concerned as you can see the dosage that should be given is 4 million units in a tds dose apart from that all the doses are given over here these are the doses which increase the lung penetration and improve the delivery of the drug into the lung parenchyma as you can see the dose for meropenem here which is given is around 1 gram 4 to 6 hourly so we must increase the frequency and the concentration to make it more available to the lung parenchyma so coming finally to the prevention how to prevent ARDS patients developing a pneumonia the recommendation is to go with the standard bundles that are there and have an early weaning strategy and the next things which can be useful but have some expense factor is the automated endotracheal cuff pressure monitoring subglottic secretion drainage and something which can be considered because it has not yet been established is the selective oral and digestive decontamination which has definitely shown to be of benefit in select populations and but we still have it established its role outside in other environments lastly the thing which we do very commonly and which may be harmful and recent data and multiple meta-analysis are showing that something like this can be harmful is the oral care with chlorhexidine this has been shown to increase BAP rates in certain populations so it is high time to rethink our oral care and whether we should continue giving oral cares with chlorhexidine mouthwash thank you for your patience and check our website for further information